Hello everyone, you are welcome again to my YouTube channel. If this is your first time here on my YouTube channel, my name is Dr. Emmanuel Lobodo. I've been working in the UK as a specialty biomedical scientist and I'm also a lecturer here in the United Kingdom in biomedical science department. I'm going to be talking to us about something that is very important, but before I really get into that, I want to kind of recap a little bit what I have said before. I did mention to you guys about so many factors that can affect a clotting result. So we looked at the pre-analytical test, like whether the sample is clotted, whether it is underfilled, is it hemolyzed, lipemic, or hysteris, as the case may be, could affect this result. Another thing that we looked at was the fact that the patient might be on anticoagulant. Why would a doctor prescribe anticoagulant? Why would a doctor prescribe heparin or warfarin for a patient? In some cases, it could just be because this patient has got a kind of clotting disorder where the system can just, you know, abnormally be clotted. So in order to prevent that, anticoagulant may be prescribed. Anyway, I did also mention that sometimes it's not because of this anticoagulant, it could be because it's a factor deficiency. Then that's why I did talk about a mixing study and all of that. So today I'm going to be talking about hemophilia. What then is hemophilia? Hemophilia is a kind of genetic disorder where the blood is not able to clot properly. So anybody who have got hemophilia, it means that this person's system, blood, can, does not clot properly. And that is why when you do the person coagulation test, you're going to get prolonged results, depending on what the factor that is actually being affected. So with hemophilia, it means that the system, the blood is not able to clot properly and this can be inherited disorder. Hemophilia, therefore, can then be as a result of a clotting factor such as maybe factor 8 or factor 9. So, when you talk about hemophilia, it's divided into two. So, you have hemophilia A, you have hemophilia B. Remember I said that hemophilia has to do that the blood is not able to clot properly and is due to inherited disorder. So, on this occasion, why wouldn't the blood clot properly? It's because of a factor deficiency. Now, in this hemophilia, there are two main factors we are going to be focusing on, which is factor 8 and factor 9. Okay? Therefore, when you talk about hemophilia, it's divided into two. You have hemophilia A, you have hemophilia B. So, because there's a deficiency in the clotting factor, which can affect the overall performance of the clotting casket. Therefore, you now see that when a patient is hemophilia A, it is associated with clotting factor 8. When a patient is, when a patient is hemophilia A, that condition is associated with clotting factor 8. When a patient is hemophilia B, that condition is associated with clotting factor 9. Then, what does it mean? It means then that when you talk about two types of hemophilia, which is hemophilia A and hemophilia B, you then say that hemophilia A is due to the deficiency in factor 8, while hemophilia B is due to the deficiency in factor 9. So, therefore, when you now look at hemophilia at large and say it's a condition, an inherited disorder where the blood is not able to clot properly, what you are then referring then that it could be due to the deficiency in factor 8 or it could be due to the deficiency in factor 9. When it is factor 8, it is called hemophilia A and when it is factor 9, it is called hemophilia B. Now, the, the degree of the condition might differ. So it could be mild, it could be moderate, it could be severe. So what does it really mean? So it depends on the degree of the deficiency of the clotting factor. So it depends on the degree of deficiency of factor 8 or factor 9, as the case may be. So the higher the degree of the deficiency of the factor, the more severe the condition might be. So it can be mild, it can be moderate, or it can be severe. But what I want you to get so far is the fact that hemophilia, the blood is not able to clot properly, and it's an inherited disorder, and it could be due to factor 8 deficiency, or it could be due to factor 9 deficiency. If it is factor 8 deficiency, it's hemophilia A, and if it is factor 9, it's hemophilia B. So what then happens is that there are some genes, there are genes that give instruction for the production of the clotting factors, okay? And once these very genes that give instructions for the production of the clotting factor has been affected due to mutation, 
that then can have an effect. And the effect it will have then, it will then prevent these very clotting factors, okay, to be able to work properly. And because of that instruction, that genetic code instruction that helped in the production of these clotting factors have been affected, have mutated, there's a change now. That change will affect the overall function of that very uh, outcome. And therefore, making it not to clot properly or not to function properly. And because it's not functioning properly, that then can now lead to a deficiency in that very clotting factor. Okay, and these very changes or this very gene that you know that has to, that is associated with this very clotting factor is mostly seen in the X chromosome. And because they are seen in the X chromosome, can I just say then that you know the female has got two X chromosomes, and the male has got one X chromosome, and of course one Y chromosome. What it then means then is that if there is hemophilia in male. It's likely to affect them more because hemophilia is, is a disease mostly associated genetically which is mainly about X chromosome. And if there is only one X chromosome in a male, it then means then that if a male person uh, you know, have hemophilia, the person is likely to be affected more than that of the female. Why? Because the female has got two X chromosomes. In other words, the female may be affected in one X chromosome, but because of there is still another X chromosome that can compensate that. Now, let me explain this more. What it means then is that there could be a mutation in one of the X chromosomes. Yes, it could affect the clotting factors, but if there is no such mutation in the other X chromosome, that can compensate, that can help, you know, to compensate that deficiency because it will not be noticeable as much because the other chromosome will be producing enough clotting factors. However, the only time it can affect females severely if the two X chromosome has been affected by this very mutation. And that is why when you look at the male, male when it comes to male, because it's one X chromosome, so either that condition, you look at one copy. So because it's, it's just one X chromosome. But then in a female, you might look at maybe two copies, but it's very rare. What, what it means that if it is one X chromosome of the female is affected, that is one copy anyway, but if it is a two of them, which is very rare, that is being affected, that would then be two copies, okay, of that X chromosome mutation. Anyway, what I really want to say here is that this deficiency in the clotting factor eight or nine is mainly associated genetically with X chromosome. So it is a mutation in that X chromosome that can now result to this very hemophilia. Okay? What, what it means then is that when one X of the female chromosome is being affected, you can refer the person as a carrier because the other one is going to compensate. So while that deficiency is there, while that abnormality is there, you may not notice it because the other X chromosome is compensating that. So the person might be a carrier. But don't forget that if the person gives birth, it can actually pass that, even though it's a carrier, it can still pass that abnormality to the baby. So when somebody has hemophilia, what can that lead to? There are so many things it can lead to. Of course, you know from what I've said, there is a deficiency in the factor 8, that's hemophilia A. Deficiency in factor 9, hemophilia B. What it then means that if there is that deficiency, the person is prone to bleed. Okay? Because that deficiency will, will mess up the whole clotting casket. Because once it gets to that point, you know, it's going to, it, it can it will be difficult to then lead to the next, you know, casket with the next step of the casket, which can then affect the overall, meaning that the clotting may not really occur quickly. So because of that, there can be a lot of bleeding. So there can be a lot of bleeding with the joint, which is chronic joint disease. So there can be a, there can be bleeding in the head, in the brain, and of course, this is sometimes can even lead to what we call seizure and also paralysis. Okay, so that's why sometimes when people who are having seizure, it could be due to this associated of hemophilia. Okay, then another thing, of course, is that of course because of that seizure, of course, where it is not being controlled, of course, hemophilia then can lead to death. Hemophilia then can lead to death because if the, the person is bleeding and you are not able to stop it, that will be death. Or maybe if, it if the, the bleeding occurred in a vital organ such as brain, of course, that as well can also lead to death. So these are the causes or the resultant effect of this very hemophilia. Hemophilia A can also be known as classic hemophilia. And hemophilia B can be what we call Christmas you know, disease. Now, what are the signs and symptoms associated with hemophilia? The signs obviously is bleeding. 
okay? But I'm going to list a number of things that is a sign of uh, symptoms of hemophilia. Number one, okay, bleeding into joint. And because of this bleeding into joint, it can lead to the swelling, it can lead to pain, tightness, which can then be in the knees, elbows, and ankles. Another factor, number two, so bleeding into skin, and this can be associated with the bruising or muscle and soft tissue causing a buildup of blood, and that is called hematoma. Number three, a look at bleeding in the mouth and gum, and that can be hard. You know, when somebody is brushing, there's a lot of bleed. You know, too, you know, it can be too difficult to stop it when there's excessive bleeding. That, that can be a sign of this very hemophilia. Then also you can look at bleeding following circumcision, you know, when there's a surgery, okay, in a female, in a male. So following circumcision, okay, that bleed, that cannot, if the person is having hemophilia, you know, there's going to be a lot of bleed and it will be difficult to stop. Another thing that bleeding following a shot, you know, like when somebody has taken vaccination, the person will continue to bleed, it's difficult to stop. It can also be a sign of hemophilia. Bleeding in the head of an infant following delivery. Blood in the urine and stool, frequent and difficult to stop nose bleeding, can also be a sign of hemophilia. So basically, when you look at the sign and symptoms of hemophilia, it has to do with the bleeding, whether it is in the brain, whether it is in the bones or the ankles or the joint, as the case may be, they are all signs, or maybe in the gum or the mouth. What not that it can not that somebody cannot bleed, of course, but when it is difficult to stop, then these are one of the signs. These are the signs then that are associated with hemophilia. How then do we diagnose hemophilia? Obviously, of course, we have to do coagulation test. Okay, so we then do routine coagulation. And of course, remember what we said before. So when we do that routine coagulation, remember that factor eight and factor nine, they are mostly intrinsic factors. Okay, good. Now, because they are mostly intrinsic factors, then it means that you might have a raised APTT because APTT measures intrinsic pathway. So you might have raised APTT. So when you have raised APTT, then you then have to investigate whether it is a deficiency in the factor eight or factor nine. Then, if you investigate it, if it's a deficiency in factor eight due to low factor eight, or deficiency in factor nine due to low factor nine, it then means if it is factor eight, hemophilia A, if it is factor nine, if hemophilia B. Anyway, the diagnosis means you have to do routine coagulation, and following the result, okay, if a prolonged APTT, we then can do a factor assay. That factor assay then, of course, if we do a mixing study and all that, and it suggests a, a factor deficiency, then we can then do a factor assay to see whether it is factor 8 or factor 9. If it is them, then you now know that it is likely that this person has got hemophilia. How do we then treat it? With the treatment, we have to replace that clotting factors that, will, that, are, that is deficient, we have to replace it. And how do we do that? Through infusing in the vein, okay? So a commercially prepared clotting factor 8 or factor 9, depending on the one that is deficient, can actually be given through the vein. And most importantly, someone who has hemophilia is always good for the first person to take his or her treatment by visiting Hemophilia Treatment Center, which is HTC. Hemophilia can be associated by inhibitors. And this inhibitor can be as a result of some, the suppressing system you know, antibody is supposed to help for something. But when antibody start attacking, you know, start causing problem in the system, okay, you know, that become a problem. And that's what happened with inhibitor. When the person start developing an antibody against clotting factors. So when somebody start developing an antibody against a clot against clotting factors, that thing can is now what we call inhibitor because it's inhibiting or preventing the blood from clotting by you know, because it's affect, it's attacking the clotting factor and that can affect the rate of blood clotting. So once the person's system starts developing antibody against the clotting factor, that is inhibitor. So you can see that inhibitor, of course, is also associated with hemophilia. So someone who has got this hemophilia, it could be triggered by an inhibitor. Some Maybe inhibitor, something attacking factor 8 or something attacking factor 9, as the case may be. So inhibitor is also one of the things associated with hemophilia. And because of that, then, it makes the treatment very difficult. Because with this inhibitor, you know, once it's attacking the clotting factor, it means that when somebody starts bleeding, it will be difficult for you to stop that. And that will make the treatment very difficult. And of course, it's going to also cost a lot of money to be able to actually take care of that person. Because a lot then has to be put in place in terms of making sure you replenish the factors that have been attacked by these very inhibitors. 
An example of some of these inhibitors, like I've mentioned, which I'm going to look at in detail, is like lupus anticoagulant, antithrombin 3, protein C, protein S, and so on. So these are some of the examples. So what I want to then to get here is this. Let's recap. Now that you've known what hemophilia is, I'm going to just recap it for you. So when you talk about hemophilia, it that is a genetic disorder where someone's S chromosome is being affected, and that effect, that change. Or mutation may have been affected either factor 8 or factor 9 and that could lead to a deficiency in factor 8 or factor 9 therefore leading to a bleeding disorder because of the the clotting factors not functioning very well and the clotting factors we are looking at here is mostly factor 8 when it is hemophilia a or factor 9 when it is hemophilia b now one of the symptoms that we mentioned is about bleeding so we mentioned about bruises as well. We mentioned about bruises. We mentioned about seizure. Okay. We also mentioned about, of course, the seizure may be being triggered because the person bleed. You know, the ble the bleeding occurs in the brain, or as the case may be. We also mentioned about you know bleeding from the mouth or the gum. So what it means then? You might go for interview. They may tell you a patient is rushed in air and with a lot of bruises, okay, or maybe um, a lot of bleeding from the mouth, whatever, as the case may be. In addition to the what I have told you before about that maybe it is possible that there is a high level of anticoagulant, you may also need to consider the fact that maybe this person may be having hemophilia in your answers. Okay, so that is it. When you, when they, when they ask you that question about someone bleeding, rush to the hospital, whatever, you now know additional thing that you can add. Or maybe when they ask you about hemophilia or type of hemophilia, you now know what you can be able to answer and what is affected and all that. What I want us to know that each of these things that we've been discussing, they are related. So hopefully, I'm going to try to connect this with maybe talking about lupus anticoagulant, thrombophilia. I try to talk about something like DIC, PE, and I'm going to really focus mainly to see how we can talk more about coagulation. Okay. Then I also want to do more video for other things for you guys. Don't worry. Um, so that is where you go. Please, could you just put a comment in the comment section and let me know what you think about the videos or if you do have any question. Once again, my name is Dr. Emmanuel Lobodo. Can I please ask, share, like, and subscribe. Thank you very much till I come back away again. Bye-bye.